The following program has been pre-recorded, so please don't call in at this time. If you wish to participate in the program, tune in at 5 p.m. every Wednesday for A Pause for Thought on Baton Rouge Community Radio. Well, good evening, fellow humans. This is Wayne Parker, still trying to figure out the soundboard here at WHYR.org. This is a pause for thought on Baton Rouge Community Radio, the only live call-in show so far. And that is, you can call in at 343-9927, 343-9927, if you'd like to call in and share your thoughts and ideas with us. Um... We have Johnny Parker in the studio with us tonight. Uh, I do want to caution, though, uh, anyone who does call in will be expected to be respectful and decent. Anyway, um, the topic for tonight is another question. Oh, by the way, good evening, Johnny. Good, uh, good evening, Wayne. Good, good to, to have be you here. here. Yeah, good to have you here. It's good to have uh, the board straight again. But uh, our question for tonight is, which is better, society or solitude? Do we need either of them? Do we need both of them? And I thought I'd start off, Johnny, with a couple of quotes here, one by Ralph Waldo Emerson, which I'm sure everyone who reads him was anticipating. Um, He wrote concerning society that, quote, society is a joint stock company in which the members agree for the better securing of his bread to each shareholder to surrender the liberty and culture of the eater. The virtue in most request is conformity. Self-reliance is its aversion. It loves not realities and creators, but names and customs. Whoso would be a man must be a nonconformist. And, of course, he wrote that in his essay, Self-Reliance, when he was urging people to do as they, their inner genius dictated and not um, what society was doing, what everybody else was doing. Um, and, I, you know, I thought about that. Society loves not realities and creators, but names and customs. And the first thing that came to mind was Einstein's general theory of relativity. Um, up until that point, everyone believed that Newtonian physics was just about everything there was to know, and there was no further to go in, in physics, and then... Einstein came up with this wild idea, and they rebelled against him and ignored him. There was another guy back in the late 19th century, a doctor, Ignaz Semmelweis. Are you familiar with him? No. He was an obstetrician, and during that time, the uh, death rate of babies was very high. The infant mortality rate was extremely high. This was in Europe. And he noticed that the doctors that were going in to deliver babies were coming fresh from the morgue where they were doing autopsies. And he made the simple observation that maybe if you guys washed your hands and arms before going in to deliver babies, there might be, uh, you know, and he was ridiculed and, and just, just laughed at. And finally he prevailed and got them to try it. And um, lo and behold, he was right. But then he was ostracized. He couldn't find a job anywhere in the country for a long time. But uh, the, other, the other thing regarding society and solitude uh, was by Thoreau, which he wrote in his book Walden, which... Uh, those of you who know of Thoreau know he was the the name of the book he wrote about his time, his two years or in four months, I think it was, living on Walden Pond. Thoreau wrote, I had gone down to the woods for other purposes, but wherever a man goes, men will pursue and paw him with their dirty institutions, and if they can, constrain him to belong to their desperate odd fellow society. It is true I might have resisted forcibly with more or less effect, might have run amuck against society, so to speak, but I prefer that society should run amuck against me, it being the desperate party. And I myself have encountered um, resentment from total strangers simply because I rode motorcycles. And they just, it was like, who were you, you know? And I, 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 the only way I could theorize it was that they, I was showing them up by being brave enough to um, to go out there and ride, you know, when they wanted to, but were afraid of getting hurt. But um, anyway, 
Kendall, Kendall Losey just joined us in the studio. Traffic wasn't so good for your relief, I guess, huh? Uh, no, uh, there was a few wrecks on the interstate, but uh, I'm here, so... Yes, you are good. here, and uh, <laughs> you probably heard coming over that I geeked up my intro again, but uh, that's all part of it. I'm only human. That's. I wish I were something better. Well, <laughs> well no, not really. Anyway, um, Johnny, your thoughts on that? And you, uh, Kendall, you know the topic, right? Society versus solitude? Yes. Okay, and you heard what I just said about from uh, Thoreau and Emerson. What's your take on society, Johnny? Well, I'm going to go back maybe and attempt to build on that first uh, quote from uh, Emerson. Okay. I think I probably did more reading up on Emerson. And he had a lot of interesting things to to say about, of course, uh, solitude and society. And I go without quoting him at this point, what I think I understand what he's saying is we need both. And we need both one foot, one hand in society and one hand in solitude. And um, one quote he says, the unlike mind can teach him much. And I think he was referring to not only can he learn much in solitude, but when he goes back in society, he needs to take that learning and solitude with him to be surrounded by other unlike minds so that basically he learns how to stay true to himself that he has continued discovered in, I in isolation or in solitude back when he returns to society, which is totally different. I'm not sure I'm grasping that point, Johnny. Um, unlike minds, you're saying he goes into society to, to be among or find unlike minds to inspire him or to, to challenge him, maybe? I think w that yeah. would be both. Okay. Because in, in one other um, place he says, We require such a solitude as shall hold us to its revelations, revelations excuse me, when we are in the street and in palaces. Okay. Yeah, and I, I can identify with that. Kendall, you're a young fellow, but I'll bet you have a fresh perspective on that idea. On the idea of... It's, uh, opposing voices being of benefit to us. Well... Or opposing opinions, that sort of thing. Different people. Nonconformists. Well, I absolutely agree with that. Um, the uh, Any opposing voices can, cha can change your, your viewpoint if you have an open mind. And so... Um, you know, and and I think that having hearing for from mo more people uh, does us good um, because you know sometimes our eyes can be opened to things that uh, that our eyes wouldn't be open to if it, if we were you know among I, less people. I agree. You know, it just occurred to me, and Emerson described this. I don't I don't know the statement well enough to paraphrase it, so I won't even try. But we are actually blocked by our own opinions of the time, our own understanding. We have to overcome our beliefs that we have right now. And that takes a lot of work, a lot of practice at least. You know, if right. the more you do it, the easier it becomes, just like anything else. But it's still yeah, just by having opinions and beliefs in something, you set up barriers to yourself to learn more. And that's where other people that you trust and like and or, you know that's why I want people to call in here with different ideas. Uh the number is 343-9927. Feel free to call in and share your thoughts on the topic. But we like disagreements, and certainly I like disagreement when I'm wrong. Uh, and when I am wrong, I'd prefer to be at least the second person to know about it. <laughs> but but uh, anyway, um, let me see. But anyway, anyway you were, Johnny, you were saying that we need both society and solitude. Um, equal halves of each, or what? Well, I would say that Emerson said that. Okay. And I'm echoing Emerson. That's okay. fine. Okay. How, how does that sound? Well, you agreed with him, so yeah, it's, it's just absolutely. as though you thought of it on your own anyway. <laughs> I won't go there. Here's, here's something else that you mentioned, self-reliance, the essay. Uh, here's an uh, interpretation by another uh, writer uh, who says that to him, it says, insist on yourself, never imitate your own gift, you can present every moment with the cumulative force of a whole life's cultivation. But of the adopted talent of another, you have only an extemporaneous half-possession. Nothing can bring you peace but yourself. 
nothing can bring you peace but the triumph of principles. And to me, that that says a whole lot. Okay, I may need, you, yourself. I, I may need you to share that with me a little while. We have a phone call. Good evening. You're uh, on a pause for thought. May I know who's calling, please? Hey, this is Dan. Hey, Dan. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. What you got? <laughs> well, I, just uh, a comment on uh, one of your uh, one of your panelists was uh, remarking on the, the need for both society and solitude. I, I think there's also the, the possibility of, uh, of uh, negative uh, societal influence, but over so- socialization. Um, it seems like with the with the, the advent of social networking that people have begun trying to maintain these uh, huge numbers of relationships with people with whom they're only uh, marginally connected and I think there's a certain amount of uh, psychological stress that comes from that it's, uh, I'm reminded of the line from, from Lord of the Rings where Bilbo was describing feeling like butter spread over too much bread um, I think that, that while we do need society I think we also need to uh, maintain a certain sense of boundaries in how how thinly we spread ourselves. I like that, Dan. I like that a lot. And as a matter of fact, Kendall <laughs> here, our uh, youngster in the group, was nodding his head vigorously, and uh, you were echoing his thoughts. To Kendall, can you respond to Dan? Absolutely. Um, actually, today, starting my my little Facebook fasting, uh, because. I can't. I'm. I'm getting tired of dealing with the the social media uh, aspect of it, and I think too many too many people can be a bad thing as well. Um, I did say earlier that the more people, the better. But you know, at some point, it does get it get it does get a little overwhelming. Yeah, it, it gets it gets to be a point. And I wonder if maybe you uh, we should screen who we allow into our lives more carefully. Yeah. <laughs> Dan, is, is, uh, does that pretty much get along with what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, I think there's something to be benefited from, from, you know, hearing a lot of different viewpoints and, and uh, you know, keeping an open mind in that sense. But I think with social networking, you, you also have a sense that there's a kind of a demand for, you know, on some level, uh, kind of a two-way relationship there even if even if you're not you know responding to posts on twitter or something it's kind of implied that you know by by you know making these friends on these different social networking platforms you are entering into some sort of a, a you know a speaking and listening relationship with someone and I, I don't know i just i think that maybe even on an unconscious level i think there's a demand for that that you know it, it can kind of wear you out well i i totally agree yeah i would agree too and I, I think that Emerson was, was making this point um, when he says that we have to be true to our own principles. And so often a lot of us are out there in society not being true to ourselves, but wanting to be true to everybody else. Yeah. And being friends with everybody else, hundreds, if not more, and feeling just like I hear your, your feeling, Dan. And I don't think you're alone. I'm, I've been in that position many years. Trying to, trying to be too many things to too many different people. Right, exactly. And I think maybe what Thoreau and Emerson uh, were saying is, okay, there's going to be times in our lives, everybody's lives, if we choose to, to step out away from society, enter into solitude for a period of time, learn more about ourselves before we go back and go back much stronger, much uh, much more deep in our uh, will and knowing who we are and standing up for who we are. I agree. Yeah, and I think like what you're saying, Dan, and then we, we probably should let you go so someone else can call in. Uh, we're, we, don't, we don't have time to center ourselves. We don't have time to put our own thoughts together and get back to our true selves if we're constantly being dissipated on social network in responding to people. We, we're constantly uh, kept on a superficial level, so to speak. Yeah. Okay, anything more, Dan? Uh, I think that's it. Thanks a lot. All right, thank you. Okay, that brings me up. Johnny, if you don't mind, I'll jump in with a... Uh, Go right ahead. Uh, qu- another quote by Thoreau that's pertinent to Dan's call. Uh, Thoreau maintained uh, a written correspondence. Obviously, back then, it wasn't phone or telegraph or anything or internet 
uh, with a, a gentleman named Harrison Gray Otis Blake, and they they exchanged letters between eight from 1848 to 1861, and uh, Mr. Blake initiated the correspondence, and I have a quote here from one of uh, Thoreau's letters to him concerning solitude and society, and this is what Thoreau had to say to him. As for the dispute about solitude and society, any comparison is impertinent. It is an idling down on the plain at the base of a mountain instead of climbing steadily to its top. Of course, you will be glad of all the society you can get to go up with. I love society so much that I swallowed it all at one gulp, that is, all that came in my way. It is not that we love to be alone, but that we love to soar, and when we do soar, the company grows thinner and thinner till there is none at all. It is either a tribune on the plain, a sermon on the mount, or a private, very private ecstasy still higher up. We are not less to aim at the summits, though the multitude does not ascend them. Uh, good evening. You're on the air with a pause for thought, man. Oh, who's, call, who's calling, please? Uh, this is Glenda Matai. Glenda, good to meet you. Uh, good to hear from you. What you got? Yes, I'm glad to be uh, uh, listening to an in- interesting conversation. Well, good. I'm glad. I'm glad somebody finds this interesting. Um, yeah. I, I think I believe uh, I agree with uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson's uh, comments and uh, John Parker's, in that we do need both. We need uh, society, and we do need the individual solitude. But I think what's exciting about this time uh, in history is that we're witnessing uh, the collective consciousness of the individual that is pushing against uh, a societal um, barrier where they have not been included, and the individual is demanding uh, on a collective basis, they're demanding uh, attention and change that will represent the leading edge of their own thought in a new future. Uh, I believe it's a very exciting time, and uh, and I'm just very excited. Are you referring to the current political contests going on in the nation? Yes, I am, because um, it's just important to realize where we've come from, how oppressed everyone feels. I work in the psychiatric world, and oh. uh, the evidence of uh, people's lives deteriorating on a level where uh, they're not able to communicate their thoughts, they're, they don't feel accepted, they lose their jobs, they experience financial difficulties. And uh, I think we are seeing a collective rising of the consciousness of that individual in numbers that want to be, want to have a voice. And I think, you know, you're seeing people that are represented now and are finding their way and they're making their statements heard at least. I I totally agree with you. And uh, I think there are a lot of people, well, obviously there are a lot of people who do. Um, in fact, I was talking to Johnny before the show, and I said that, you know, Trump and Sanders both represent the general discontent among a large number of Americans with the way things have been going. And um, there's just, there's no substance anymore to presidential campaigns. Nobody's really talking about anything but what they think the masses will uh, want to hear. And I think there are a lot, uh, there's a lot larger group of people out there that, you know, is tired of all that. Uh, and what we've been seeing uh, traditionally is a competition for power. Uh, it still stands in, in, in that kind of arena, but you're seeing that quiet voice of Bernie Sanders um, uh, people that are rising, uh, that want to be heard, that have been left out. Uh, the haves and the have-nots, uh, they are tired of being left out, and they just want to be right. heard. And they may say that Bernie's too old, but I'm saying he's old enough to remember what democracy is. I totally agree. Um, and if you're involved in the uh, psychiatric field, I'm, I'd appreciate you calling the station uh, after we go off the air. Uh, Glenda, we got to move on, though. Do you have anything else you want to add? No, I've enjoyed the time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, that was a good uh, good perspective there. And like I said, Johnny, you and I were talking about that at the very beginning, that... Uh, we need society, and uh, we're seeing now the people who are left out of it because they don't get along with it. Well, they're they're mass appealing. Hey, I'm a short guy. 
you know, I can't get shoes to fit me anywhere. I, you know, they never had baseball uniforms that fit me because I, I was outside the norm. I was outside the mainstream, so I, I'm familiar with that. Um, and, and what I hear Glenda saying and commenting on is what, just to build on, on your comment there, is that they are too nonconformist. They that, are. That were mentioned there. At the opposite ends of the political spectrum, but they are too nonconformist. Yes. And they are bringing something uh, back into society. And uh, depending on which end of the spectrum that that you feel comfortable with and want to go with, that's another issue. But I think that's uh, what both Thoreau and Emerson were saying is that um, that we need people to come out of this, that go into the solitude, that come back out of the solitude and bring their their learnings, their experience, their knowledge, their character. Um, somebody like the Dalai Lama who I think would represent that from the Buddhism point of view, who lives in that world, but also lives in the, the, the world of society. And he brings that knowledge, he brings that depth of, of humanity with him into society as a, as a representative of what we all can aspire to as, as, as human beings. So, see what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. So, I so do. he would be one example I would put up that I think would mirror maybe what Emerson and Thoreau were mirroring in terms of, okay, it's the job of a of a person to go out in solitude, but it's also the job of the same person to come back in society. Well, you have to maintain um, grounding in real life, too. I mean, what good right. is it if you're the wisest person in the world and you don't share it with people? You know exactly how wise of, is that? How really? wise is it? Yeah, how wise? How wise can it be? Right. Because there's no context. Kelly, you were going to say something. Mm-mm. Okay, uh-huh. just coughing. <laughs> okay, yeah. but yeah, I, I think it it goes both ways. You need to go out in society to gain perspective from that side, and test your thoughts, so to speak. You know, I was once an idealist and a zealot, and I won't go into what kind. You know, though, um, but it was reality that made me see that. I was an idealist. Ideals are perfect, and there is no such thing as perfect. Nothing is na- in nature is perfect except right. nature itself. Right. You know, but it's perfect because, <clears throat> precisely because of all of its imperfections. So, but, when you uh, said reality, not put you on the spot. That's okay. Do you mean society? Well, yes. Uh, okay. w- what's actually going on out there? Right. Okay. Right. Sure. There's a, there's the preferred way that we all all would like people to behave. You know, giving, sharing, respectful, all that stuff. But then there's the reality of what people really are, you know, and we all stray from the the ideal path. And, you know, anybody who really wants to understand and be a contribution, I think, needs to understand that. So he needs to get out among people and see and test his ideas and see what would work. But by the same token, when when the person goes back into their solitude, they now have a new perspective on how to focus their thoughts. Right. So it's a good balance of everything. One would think, yeah, and and um, but just occurred to me: Are we talking about most people here, or are we talking about um, a more uh, a smaller group? I'll put it that way. Well, I would say it's whoever wants to strive to be um, a person that's different from what they are right now. If they want to grow in their life, and I think that's what we're talking about, and I think Thoreau is is a model we can use. And Emerson is a model we can use. And Emerson goes on to say real quickly that not only should a person go out in the solitude to learn more of themselves and about society as viewed from outside society, but then they have a debt, a debt to return to society and to bring that learning back. And if they don't, they really have not achieved anything for themselves. They've only fooled themselves into thinking they've done something of value. And which one, was, which one was it that said this? This was Thoreau. How about I, I mean, uh, Emerson. It was Emerson. Emerson. How about right. that? And I'm sure Thoreau probably said it. Probably, yeah. But, but uh, I've, I've been reading the Emerson more than the Thoreau. Yeah, and I'm, I'm more of a Thoreau guy. Right. But, uh, that, I, I like that. I like that very much. In fact, Tolstoy made the same observation. He said, if you're rich, you have an obligation to help the poor. If you're wise, you have an obligation to help right. the not so wise, you know, things like that. Right. You know, and that's why I think nature gives us all unique gifts, not so that we can just hoard them to ourselves or enrich ourselves, but to share with others. And I, I, I think right. Emerson hit the nail on the head, so, you know, and you did too, in mirroring him. Um, 
I wouldn't want to give you any credit for thinking anything on your own, John. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, is there such a thing as a, an original thought? You know, I mean, the, uh, well, that's another question, I suppose. We got five minutes left. This is a pause for thought. Wayne Parker on WHYR dot or WHYR. 96.9 FM, Baton Rouge Community Radio. You're welcome to call in at 343-9927. We have a little bit of time left here. And we're discussing whether society and, or the, the merits. We've already come past whether or not we need society or solitude, but there are, um, we're discussing the merits of each now. Um, could there be a society of individuals a society of nonconformists so to speak i guess probably by <laughs> definition i would have to say no if you're talking about 100 percent if nobody conformed with anybody else yeah it would it'd be sort of a mess pardon the word but just a mess there would have to be some kind of unifying exactly system, right right um, yeah you'd have to agree to respect differences for one thing Right. You know, things like that. So uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's so, yeah, in that sense, there is there is no um, ideal society. Well, there's no ideal society of individuals, right, because right. you have to have that. But, um, yeah, you know, I thought, too, in, in anticipating this show, we have introverts and extroverts, and I've been told that generally uh, it's it's actually a broad range of, qualities that define you as one or the other I've been told um, but it, basically people say introverts get their energy from being alone, extroverts get their energy from other people external sources and I don't mean to be judgmental but I just think that if you require other people for your energy you're lacking something and and that's just my sense, I don't mean, like I said I don't mean to be judgmental, that's just it's just the way it appears to me. Anybody, you guys, anybody, anybody, I call him. You, I, I, I'm getting well, blank looks here. I well, think, well I <laughs> okay, go ahead. I've, I've got a comment. Go ahead, Kendall. I think you have to, um, you, 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 you get energy, I, I get energy from, from both, really. I, I think, I think I'm more introverted than extroverted, but I, I feel like I get energy by being among people because, um, you know, it it allows me to kind of share my thoughts and share my, you know, w what my thought, you know, and make a. That's uh, hard. It's hard for me to say that. Uh, for me to, uh, you know, have a group of people to get something done. And, and I think that um, having a you know people around, you know, kind of boosts it a little bit. You know pushes you through no I I, I I i totally agree kendall totally agree johnny what was your comment what was your response i guess i would ask uh, the question from the opposite direction if you need solitude to be energized the question would be why uh, you know oh. you were you were saying something about being judgmental going the other side if you have to have be around people to be energized and what's the what's the issue so uh, maybe see. the maybe the issue yeah. maybe the question goes back the other way because uh, it, and, may, know, and maybe that's why introvert and extrovert are um, they're, they're not simple black and white categories no, because no. you're right I'm like Kendall I, I always view myself more as an introvert because I go out and get among people have a great time for a while and then I want to go the heck home and not be bothered right you so know? what are you introvert or extrovert you're I on the radio know. right now I yeah. don't know <laughs> introverts on the radio Wayne. yeah but well <laughs> the only problem with being, <laughs> The only thing I know for sure about radio is when you make a joke, you can't hear anybody laughing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they're out there. <laughs> yeah, somebody is anyway. But uh, yeah, I think I think you're right. Yeah. I think uh, maybe the whole pigeonholing of introverts and extroverts is um, anybody to either extreme would be bad. Yeah. Ted Kaczynski is a perfect example of an introvert who uh, went awry, so to speak. He was the Unabomber. Um, lived in a cabin in the woods, and right. uh, you know we know what he did, but. So yeah, there there are drawbacks to both. Um, you've been listening to a pause for thought. I think we've got a couple of minutes left, so we'll keep going if we're able to keep talking long enough. Um, here's a, here's a quote, real okay. quick. Nothing. This is Emerson. Nothing but God is self dependent. Man is powerful only by the multitude of his affinities. That's cool. 
the multitude of his affinities. I like that. Okay, we're gone for the evening. Uh, I thank you all for listening. You've been listening to Wayne Parker with a pause for thought with Kendall Losey and Johnny Parker here as co-hosts. And we're gone. <laughs>